Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us before we start with the session. The numbers are still rising. When the numbers start to settle, then I will wish to start the program. Good. I see we just have over 124 participants. 30 seconds more before we start. Good, I'm sure those of them that are still joining us will join us along the way. Uh, but good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Navesh Gavinder, the Chief Operating Officer of Satya. Satya is a not-for-profit industry association representing 544 members across the value chain of solar PV. Next slide, please, Kim. Please can I ask uh, participants to follow us on, on social media platforms uh, and join the conversation on driving distributed generation by using the hashtags on the slide so we can track that conversation as well. Um, as, the representative, as the representative voice of solar PV uh, in South Africa, SAPI is constantly working towards collaborating with, with stakeholders across the solar PV sector to share knowledge and drive effective change. Driving the residential, commercial, and industrial market segment to take up more distributed solar PV generation in South Africa will build local competence of global standards and accelerate the local renewable energy market. In 2020, Sapir estimated this market segment to have 1.3 gigawatts of generation capacity already installed. 80% of which is attributed to the commercial and industrial application. With the announcement from the president last week, lifting the generation license exemption cap from one megawatt to 100 megawatts, we are in store for a lot more electricity coming online a lot quicker. With this in mind, SAPIA has partnered with the Minerals Council and the Energy Intensive Users Group to present a six part series of webinars to address key areas that our industry needs to better understand. We are also very grateful uh, to our series sponsors, Genesis Eco Energy and Rand Merchant Bank, who make this information sharing possible and allows you, the participant, to attend free of charge. Next slide, please, Kim. The series program has been well thought out and planned to cover relevant and important topics. And in the spirit of knowledge is power, our aim is to share as much information as possible to encourage more participation in driving distributed generation. The dates and topics of upcoming webinars, part of the series are on your screen. Um, today is the first of a six part webinar series entitled Driving Distributed Generation. And we'll be focused on understanding um, the distributed generation policy and regulatory framework. We will then move on to the business case for, business, for, for distributed generation. In August, we'll be looking at the procuring of solar PV, a buyer's guide. In September, looking at the fundamentals of building distributed generation projects. In October, looking at maintaining and operating these plants. And then in November, looking at the energy future of solar PV plus storage. The policy and regulatory framework 
create the environment in which a sector thrives, understanding the policy, unpacking the regulations and reviewing the processes allows better understanding for more participation. The aim to drive distributed generation in South Africa should be sustainable and inclusive in nature as we strive for a just energy transition. Today, we have an esteemed panel of policymakers, market regulators, and industry leaders from both government and industry to take us through various aspects of the policy and regulatory requirements. We will be looking at the intention of policy, the practicality of implementing the policy, and the processes to undertake distributed generation projects. Unfortunately, with much disappointment, uh, the DMRE had an, an urgent commitment today and will not be able to attend. Uh, so we will cover the, the ERA schedule too as part of an industry review. Before we start, uh, please can I ask that you engage our panel by posting your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, there will be a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the webinar. The content prepared uh, by the speakers are planned to be useful and informative, and they will be shared with all participants uh, after the session. I do enjoy that each and every one of you will enjoy today's session. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. De Villiers Porter, the Chief Operating Officer of SolarF, the Chairperson of the Distributed Generation Working Group at SAPIA and a SAPIA board member, He's no stranger to advancing the small-scale embedded generation agenda, and his bio speaks volumes, uh, which will be available post the session. In the absence of our government stakeholders, De Villiers will be presenting the industry perspective on the ERA Schedule 2 and better understanding the associated NERSA licensing and registration process. Over to you, De Villiers. Thanks a lot, Nivishal. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, um, I, I hope that uh, many of you learn some new things today. Uh, we can move over to my presentation there too, uh, Kim, thank you. Um, so I will be speaking specifically to the, uh, firstly showing you a few of the stakeholders and what their roles are. It's perhaps important to understand that because people sometimes uh, get frustrated with certain aspects of the industry uh, and I mean authorities for that matter, and they should know who's responsible for what. And then we'll move on to the specific uh, acts. I'll, I'll explain to you the difference between administrative compliance and technical compliance. And then we'll move over to what we want to see and what we will for, hopefully now see in the foreseeable future. Thank you, Kim. You can move over to the next. Um, so yes, first, who are all the role players and stakeholders in the broader industry? So firstly, we have the national government. And in our industry specifically, uh, primarily it is the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. And their job is to write the acts, okay? So they draft the act and they issue the schedules uh, to the act that we all have to comply with. So regulatory uh, drafting and the thoughts behind that comes from that. Obviously with the inputs that we from industry feed up to them, also that those that they get from our other colleagues on this call uh, we will see the, the ESCOMs and the municipalities and the SALGAs of the world that also feeds their interests into the DMRE. Taking all of that and writing that into a regulation that they think would be best for the energy of the country. Hopefully, yes, we know uh, in pending, and I'll deal with that later, there's quite a few nice, uh, exciting reforms coming in there. Right, next up we have NUSA, who is someone who unfortunately acts within the four pillars of the Act. Everyone wants to always say, but NERSA has a discretion to do this or that or that. But NERSA is an enforcer of whatever the DMRE writes. So NERSA sits there and they look at the act, they look at the conduct of what someone wants to do. Is it a tariff increase? Is it a license? Is it a registration? Those matters that we'll deal with later on. And they look whether it fits within those regulatory regimes and they either give it the wrapper stamp or they refer you somewhere else. Next up, we have ESCOM that we've known. And then way back when NERSA was formed, ESCOM was essentially the only license holder um, because there were very few uh, large power uh, generators other than ESCOM in our traditional vertically integrated grid. 
Um, Iskram still is the primary generator of energy in the country. As we all know, we all rely on them for our load shedding, not or not to have load shedding, to put it that way. But what we should not forget, and that's what's coming with the imminent unbundling of Iskram, is the fact that they own the transmission grid and they also own a very large distribution grid, which is something that we can all make use of when the grids and the opportunities in the markets start to open. So ESCOM, yes, traditionally still the primary generator of power in the country, and also through the, 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 the acts whereby NERSA was established, the major contributor to NERSA's resources. Obviously, then next we have the municipalities, which is our distribution license holders. Those are where many of us that live in the, the towns or cities would be connected to them. Uh, where there is not ESCOM distribution, you will get your, your power from that distribution license holder. They would essentially buy from ESCOM and sell to us. So it is a distribution license. They are able to transmit also, or rather, let me use the correct word, distribute power across earth boundaries within their area of jurisdiction. Next, then we have the consumers. And up to there, we have the traditional vertical grid that we used to have and still have very much in the country where we have the consumers who literally plug in their appliances into the wall sockets and the generation comes from ESCO. Uh, and, and, and next up, we have then what we now find in the last few years, the last 10 years or so, our prosumers. Those are the people, whether it's a mall, whether it's a mine, whether it's the little guy at his home putting up his solar system, that becomes a prosumer. So you both generate and you still consume off the grid. Um, so you, you will still draw power from the grid, and I'll get later to reverse feed and not uh, aspects of those. Um, but you have your prosumers as a new category. And then lastly, also, we have our IPPs, who are then the guys building large solar plants whose purpose is purely to export. So the difference between an IPP and a prosumer is the IPP's primary purpose is to export all power that they generate, a prosumer will first consume and might export excess to the grid and will at times even draw again from the grid. Um, so there's then a dual relationship in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of a prosumer. Right, thank you. We can move on to the next slide then. So what do we do about regulation? Uh, what do we as industry say about regulation? And I think we agree that regulation has to be there. Um, it is important for people to act uh, legally to act compliantly, to make sure these systems are safely operated. But what we need is that we need it to be an effective process. And I'll speak to the safety and effectiveness of the process then from here onwards. Thank you. Um, so in regulation, you have two streams, or three streams rather. Firstly, you have the administrative stream. Those are all the acts and the principles of registration on the left, my blue string, the stream there, sorry. And on the right then, we have the technical and safety regulation, which is something that you will generally apply to with your utilities. And luckily today you have a very, very knowledgeable people here that's gonna take you through those processes with them um, on the utility side. And they have specific procedures that you need to comply with. So let's take our administrative regulations first on the left. If you did not register your system with NERSA, it does not mean that the building is going to burn down because of that, because it was simply an administrative process. But on the right hand side, if you did not install the necessary safety gear, which Fora von Skalkweg would later speak to regarding SANS uh, matters, there's a risk of the building burning down even though it registered. So you think which is the most important one, um, but that speaks for itself. But let us go on and look where we are currently. Um, and then also where we are moving towards in the, in the country. Um, you can go to the next one there also. Right, so as I already said, NERSA acts under the regulations that's established in the act. And then firstly, most importantly, we have the Electricity Regulation Act. Um, and that essentially, and specifically section seven of the act, refers you to that to say who may generate, trade and distribute electricity and under what conditions. It creates the basis of registration and licensing. Under that, we have the well-famous uh, Schedule 2, which uh, determines which plants would be exempt from a license. Now, the current active version is the one dated 10 November 2017, 
and I'll get to the movement through those a bit later for you. But there is now the draft out that was issued on the 23rd of April this year, where the, the draft moved from the current one megawatt uh, limitation to 10 at least. And then we have uh, obviously the, 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 the comments last week, Thursday, from uh, President Ramaphosa saying that, in fact, the 10 megawatt might even now move in the next 60 days to 100 megawatt, which, which we all uh, would be glad to embrace then. But below that also, what we shouldn't forget is that you have the integrated resource plan, which is what the DMRE uses to plan the future energy of the country. Yes, it remains a plan. So it doesn't mean we need to stick to the plan. We might exceed the plan. And I think that's what we all think might happen in the foreseeable future, yeah. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. So if we look at the technical aspects and we'll get back to the specifics on the, on the, the registration and licensing, uh, your utilities do the technical assessments on these. Each utility and being now the, your distribution license holder, whether Eskom or your municipality, would have their specific requirements. Some of them would allow you to go larger than one MVA at this stage, some of them don't. Some of them require certain uh, specific uh, attributes to be installed, technical aspects to be complied with, additional to what the basic standards would say. And uh, that is something you need to comply with, unfortunately, or fortunately rather, because the reason for that is safety is not negotiable. Um, it is all about protecting people working on the grid it is about protecting your own property. If you install an inferior product in your home, they might uh, ensue a fire, which could cause you great da da danger. And it might also be, uh, be a cause for your, for your insurance to, to, to not pay out. And just imagine what drastic uh, effect that could have. All right, thank you. Um, and then the specific procedures that I referred to is, and that you'll go through in more details with these, with our colleagues later also, uh, is obviously the NRS 097 guidelines, which is additional to each municipality's recommendation, which is a simplified guideline. It applies up to the size of one MVA and there's certain specifications above 350 and below 350 kilowatt. And then you have your SANS 101 for two, um, which gives guidelines on the specific uh, connection of the systems, which will be dealt with later with, by our colleagues. And you have your grid codes. So there are various, various grid codes. There's a transmission grid code, distribution grid code, specifically in this instance, the renewable energy grid code that you need to comply with. That also sp uh, speaks to those specific standards. Thank you. All right. So let us think what is the purpose of registration of our systems with NERSA? And the, the purpose is essentially to build a database so that we know what the capacity is that we could use in planning uh, the future electricity mix of the country. If no one registers, we won't know that there is a 10 megawatt plant perhaps situated in Limpopo that could feed a, 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 a community there, whilst the, the, the government might then say, well, they'll approve another 10 MVA one. Or, uh, so no, it's really necessary for NERSA to have that information, to feed that information back to the DMRE and also feed it downwards to the utilities to be able to do proper planning of these systems, right? So what, we'll, we, what we'd like to see as industry is that the registration should be dealt with by the utilities because at this stage already, as I've showed you on the technical aspect, you have to register and comply with your, your, your local utilities uh, registration aspects on the technical side. So firstly, you need to then register with them in any event, and uh, that information could then be fed up to NERSA, rather than where we now have the situation of running a process with your utility, stopping that process, going to NERSA, and then coming back just to proceed again. And I'll show you that on the next slide or two. So here is the, 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 the process uh, of a NERSA registration. So firstly, you have to start with your distributor um, 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 on the left-hand side, your license distributor approval. Okay, so you, you go and you apply for your connection with your distribution license holder. They evaluate the process and they send the confirmation letter uh, back to you. You then stop your process and you then go to NERSA first. So in that time, there's a 60 day and that's a working day period 
that then you run through your NERSA process, which is the phase two process on the right. And once you've done that right at the bottom, you can then go back to the, the, the utility or the distribution license holder to say, fine, I've now gotten my NERSA registration, let us now proceed. So it is a stop start in that sense, to put it in, you know, in different words, uh, a process at the moment where we would like to see a, much, a, a bit more of a fluent process going forward. Thank you, you can move on. All right, so let's look at what, what this process entails. Firstly, you start with a utility, in Munich or Eskom, as I've said, and in Eskom's case, you would obtain a budget quote, or in, in the utilities side, you would obtain a consent, which could take anything from three, three days to 10 months, depending on the complexity of the matter. And that is from personal experience. In some instances with some municipalities, we had a three-day turnaround, and uh, even shorter, we had a 72-hour turnaround once. And then also uh, you have, uh, usually if you go to a larger plant, especially on Eskom, where they have to do technical evaluations, you could wait up to 10 months for your budget quote. Then you stop the process, the technical process, you go into your admin process, which is for registration, firstly with NERSA, or then secondly, registration and license. Whether the license threshold is one meg or 10 meg or 100 meg, if you fall inside that category, you would then go to the license part. Registration is 60 working days, and that is essentially the time that NERSA can decide from when your, completion, when your submission is full. So there's a few days before and a few days after that you need to add to that process. Uh, licensing also is determined to be a 120 day process, um, but it, it often takes nine months because the 120 working days are already six months in its own. Then you get through that process, you go back to your utility and you build your product project, which could be from three weeks for a smaller project to eight months for a larger project. And the essence of this all is that it could take through this process on your larger plants, which does not mean a 50 megawatt plant. This could, could have been a two megawatt plant for that matter. It could take up to two and a half years for this to be erected. Now, if we compare to what, what, what China does uh, and, 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 and the volumes that they've built, and just perhaps to refer to that, in one year, the, China built the amount of PV that the whole South African grid comprises, and the whole ESCOM grid, in other words. So ESCOM has got assets that, if everything is operational, could generate between 44 and 46 gigawatt. And now China builds that in photovoltaic in one year alone. Um, now, just uh, I doubt they have these long processes, but the question still begs, do they have all the technical compliance? We hope so. But in our instance, the current uh, regime was that it could have taken you up to two and a half years to do that. So what are we going to do? What do we look forward to? Uh, hopefully this, this becomes uh, better, and I think it is already uh, being so. Uh, I know Silesh from Eskom um, um, and I have been through processes where it's gone much quicker than that lately. Right, thank you, we can move on. Right, so that's now your registration process and we're going on to licensing. What is the purpose of licensing? And uh, the question is always, do you affect thy neighbor? That's the easy way to think of licensing in the back of your mind. In other words, can what I do affect my neighbor? So let's take Sheila and this father's shop. If she intends to only sell sweets and and chocolates and cold drink. It means she need not apply for a liquor license. She need not worry about a liquor license because she never had an intention to sell any liquor. In that same instance, the question begs, if you never intend to export any power onto the grid, irrespective of the size, why do you then need to uh, still apply to NERSA for a license for a larger than a one megawatt? Remember, staying a net consumer, in other words, self-consuming all that power. That is uh, the one, uh, one cor correlation that you could draw. The next one also, uh, if you operate a vehicle on a, a private property and you never intend driving on a public road, you need not register that vehicle. That is an election you, you could do. So the reason we register our vehicles, the reason we have driver li driver's licenses is because we operate them in a public space. That is what they're all about. If you can't affect your neighbor, why do you need a license? So the principle that we proposed is to say, well, the, the, the licensing aspect 
should only kick in when plants to export, and then only we, in, we, we impose that limit. And that perhaps for all self-consuming sites, irrespective of size, the licenses should not apply. But registration is perhaps still a good thing to apply. But then registration, as I've mentioned, could flow up through the, the utilities that we anyhow uh, register through. I think you can move on. Right, so progression of licensing. Um, so if, you, if we go to uh, prior to 10 November 2017, we had our license regime where everything was uh, own consumption. You, you can pick that one for us, uh, Kim. Right, so our, our principle was simply own use um, did not need a license. So the interpretation there were quite open. You could uh, say, well, I'm going to generate in one spot, export the power, and still remain a net consumer, and therefore it's own use. And that was actually an interpretation that both Eskom and City of Cape Town at the time um, held, that as long as you remain a net consumer over a period of a year, irrespective of exporting and again, using that power as a prosumer, as I've indicated to you, it remained own use. Um, so that was open for interpretation. And then on 10 November 2017, we got the current uh, regime, which is then now our one megawatt uh, limitation. Kim, you could move on there. And that's when the one megawatt cap came in. Uh, it made calculations for, for, for generation much simpler or for licensing uh, purposes much simpler. But uh, what it did create was that you had to now, uh, well, what it did create is we, had, we saw a lot of plants prior to that being built in excess of one megawatt, going up to the three and the four and the fives. And remember, all of those plants, even though they were larger than one megawatt, still complied with the technical and safety compliance. If you look at the right-hand side of my screen there, we're still busy with the acts and the, the registration part here. Um, so the technical compliance, the safety, in other words, buildings are not going to burn down, were all along were there, um, even though those plants were larger than one meg. Then came the one megawatt cap, and we saw a contraction of the market. People were, well, strained by that. We also know of instances where from the IRP per, uh, per, uh, principles, the IRP took longer the, to, to come out and we had the section 10 2G applications that were lagging from the DMRE and that also placed a, a bit of a hamper on us. All right, but where are we going to? Then the future, Kim, um, is that the, the industry wants self-consumption um, irrespective of the size, plus an increase in the cap to 50 megawatt. Uh, that's what we wanted, all right? Um, so it means that you will only require a license when you're exporting to the grid, um, and then only when there is quite a large size. And that size was not just a thumb size. From our side, from Sapvia's side, my involvement in Sapvia as Nivation has played put out, we've worked with Business Unity South Africa. We've worked through Business, Un Business Unity South Africa. We've also worked with uh, Project Vulent Lela, which involves the Treasury as well as the Presidency. And we inquired from ESCOM, what would really affect your grid? And they indicated something even higher than the 50 megawatt. So from industry, we said, you know, initially we thought a 10 megawatt would be, would be great. But you know what? We then said, let's move it to 50. So uh, yes, you can pick those boxes, uh, Kim, for me. Yeah, so this is what the industry wanted. Um, luckily, now we, we see we, we hopefully getting that up to 100 megawatt, which would be uh, nice to us all. Uh, and then, Kim, if you go on, um, the number that we got to when we did a study uh, through our, 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 our membership base, that by 2025, we would build 5 gigawatt if we get this, uh, this uh, license regime out. So very good prospects in the near future. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to, to building all of that with you. You can move on. Right, so what about off-grid? So what we've seen is that under the current Schedule 2, off-grid systems need not register or license. Um, so what does that do? It actually makes grid depiction attractive, uh, depending on cost. We all know it costs a lot more to do that. But if you have an instance where there are cost-effective measures to do that, yes, you could, you could opt for that. But my opinion is we should rather nurture the grid. And the reason for that is, if you do have the grid, if we could stabilize the grid through large storage, um, 
we could in fact have a much flatter grid where we currently have, as we know, the old duck curve that creates the, 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 the evening and morning peaks. If we could flatten those through storage, we could have a more stable grid, we will avoid load shedding, and we could all benefit from that. So rather than having some guys going off grid, let us nurture the grid and have the grid available for everyone to use still. We can move on. Right. So this is just an example of an aerial shot. Now it's too far for anyone to see, even I have to flinch to or have to, have to concentrate to find some. But this is a study that 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 city of Cape Town, by example, did a while ago. And they found that only half of the systems uh, in the, their uh, regime registered. And perhaps Mary will touch on that or not later. But so only half of the people registered their systems within the city of Cape Town. And that is what we'd not like to see as industry. We'd like to rather see that systems do get registered so that we know that the compliance from an industry perspective is there. Uh, through SAPVIA, also many of you are aware that we have the PV Green Card program, um, all of those aspects where we want people to make sure that these systems are built compliant and safely. So yes, we, we'd like to see a regime where there would be an enabling environment, where we would have registration and, 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 and regulation that is useful for everyone and effective. So both admin and technical. And as I say, that everyone can and want to comply with. The next thing we want, or call it, we always have to have a wish list, is wheeling between non-related parties. So everyone might say, well, now then ESCOM will close down. And it's actually not. Because remember, this is not going to be a, a switch off and a switch on situation. We, we're going to see private generators developing, selling to other consumers who aren't able to generate. And over time, ESCOM will just simply wind down their generation assets according to its normal retirement ages. Um, and ESCOM will still remain there. They will just now be the grid operator. Now, on that, perhaps I'll give you a number to, to, to think about. Uh, the, the Chinese grid was, uh, was stripped out, um, out of the generation assets in 1998. And if the Chinese grid, uh, grid company which is government owned there, obviously. Uh, but if that was a Fortune 500 company today, it would have been number two company. So that gives you an idea that the second strongest company in the world is actually owning an electricity grid and enabling trading between different people. What we also see, we say with Wheeling, is that municipal revenue is the one thing that everyone will say, well, what will happen to the municipalities that rely on that? or the distributors for that matter, whether it's ESCOM or the, or the municipality. The principle is that the wheeling tariff could easily match, and we've, we've applied this in, in many instances, could easily match the current uh, margin that municipalities or utilities place on their uh, power that they purchase from ESCOM. So the kilowatt hours in the network will remain the same. The cents per kilowatt hour would remain the same, so the municipality would still get the revenue they would have gotten, except the, the, the generators, the wheeling generators, would generate at a lower tariff, sell at a lower tariff to the end users, which will benefit them. And as I said, ESCOM will, over time, retire their generation assets. And as I say there at the bottom, I think the, the principle is that through that, we'll have no more load shedding by 2025. So yes, takeaways finally to you. I think the, the great news is we have the 100 uh, megawatt limit uh, that's imminent. Uh, we hope that the schedule is favorable as we all hope to be. And let's look at the, 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 the next levels of wheeling and, and how we're all gonna have a safe grid to operate. But I think all my colleagues is gonna work through, with you a lot on, on those safety measures on, and, and they are from those grid companies. I'm, I'm the naughty boy always in the room want, saying what we want but they're going to tell us what we can have. And thanks a lot for this afternoon. Thank you very much, De Villiers. Uh, thank you for a very informative presentation. Uh, it has set the scene covering the policy and regulatory landscape uh, and how this is implemented through the registration and licensing processes. Uh, it has given the participants a good view on the stakeholder mapping uh, the policy guidelines and the associated processes. 
just as a reminder to participants, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function to pose your questions to the speakers. Uh, there will be a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, moving on, uh, with the increase in distributed generation, there's much to unpack with the energy distributors. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have both ESCOM and the City of Cape Town, a leading municipality, to share their SSEG processes and learning. Uh, with that, our next speaker is Mr. Sailesh Man Singh, a Master's in Engineering graduate and Certified Energy Manager and Auditor. Working at ESCOM, Silesh has extensive experience across various positions. Uh, most recently, Silesh is responsible for implementing a framework to ensure customer SSEG connections are implementable on the low voltage networks. His full bio will be made available uh, to participants post the, the session. Silesh will be presenting on how ESCOM is embracing prosumer authorized grid type connections. Over to you, Silesh. Thank you, uh, Nivation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, basically, yeah, so we will, uh, I'll take you through the process in terms of how we dealing with uh, connections. We can move on to the next slide, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kim, next slide. Okay, so I think to a large extent, the reason we hear is the landscape has changed in terms of uh, uh, energy uh, and technology to generate energy in the country has become more, more, more affordable and accessible in terms of PV. Uh, this landscape has uh, basically allowed consumers to become prosumers and uh, not just consume electricity, but generators of electricity. So these are new opportunities in the market. And uh, very importantly, I think uh, for us as a utility as correctly stated by uh, De Villiers uh, earlier on is uh, we need to make sure that these generators uh, connect to the grid in a manner that's safe. So, it's important that uh, we stress the importance uh, around the regulatory requirements in terms of compliance. And then for customers who are spending a lot of money, I think these are huge financial investments for them. Uh, it's important that they have systems that, that uh, meet the standards, prevailing standards in South Africa in terms of SABS around the technical standards for those specific systems. And then in terms of safety, we got to make sure that the manner in which these generators connect are connected safely to the grid. Thanks, next slide, Kim. Okay, so I think the point uh, here is before you connect your generator to the grid, you need to make sure whether it is ESKIM, or the local municipality, whoever supplies you, you have the respective permission. And then from NERSA in terms of uh, licensing or now possibly maybe just registration uh, for those generators uh, as required by, by NERSA and enforced by NERSA, we just need to make sure before you connect that the necessary permissions are granted. Uh, this would avoid basically having uh, unauthorized connections which pose a risk in terms of uh, operators of the grid and, and consumers as well. So I think from an ESCAM perspective, we just want to make sure that uh, we have safe legal connections on the network. Thanks, Kim. Next slide. Yeah, so um, the question is then, so why authorize? Uh, you know, there's, there's many reasons and benefits from, from authorized and I think uh, the first two slides just illustrated and spoke about safety in terms of injury has been perhaps the, the priority. We don't want any loss of life or injury on the network. Um, and then there's also a risk when we have to manage safety on the network and if there's unauthorized installation, it could result in a very unhappy customer situation if, if the specific uh, supply had to be disconnected. So. That, that, that is something I suppose as a customer you have to, to avoid. The other reasons would be like, I think the, the, the value is alluded to, the market, energy market is opening up. 
we this is creating lots of excitement and i think this is opportunities for more people to participate in that market and from the eskim perspective i think we are gearing ourselves up in terms of creating new services exciting services to to add new value in terms of how you could utilize the grid uh, the grid could be utilized as a battery whereby you could use your energy to bank you know surplus energy could be bank which you could use to offset your consumption so so these are services that that has come with the new opportunities with generation that we are looking at um then there's also opportunity for customers also alluded for the previous uh, presentation in terms of wheeling wheeling unfortunately is just limited on the high voltage and medium voltage networks and uh, those are possibilities if you're authorized uh, grid connection these are opportunities that you could uh, utilize if applicable and then similarly on the uh, other customers uh, perhaps uh, is opportunities on the LV to consolidate some of your uh, your points to be able to share within the same network and tariffs you could share your generation uh, your generator output uh, I think most importantly you are able to monitor and control your electricity usage uh, in this way and then for the rest of the customers obviously it would be about having those green credentials uh, Thank you. Next slide, Kim. Move on. Okay. Uh, this slide basically illustrates the type of connections we would have from PV purely to illustrate. The one on the top left-hand corner is basically the what we would call a grid-tied installation. Here you would have your PV system, PV and inverter basically connected to the same load in the example being the house there. Uh, where supply is received by both the grid and the panel in parallel. So the PV and the grid is supplying the same. That is what we would classify as grid tight, running both systems in parallel for the same load. And those are the ones basically where you would have to have uh, permission uh, from the utility uh, to connect. And then obviously it would come with licensing requirements or registration requirements from the regulator to be able to operate that uh, system. The one in the bottom is the off-grid situation. So that's basically illustrating that you would have basically supply, um, uh, you would have supply basically uh, from the PV system alone uh, to the specific load, in this case being the house, and there's no basically grid supplying that house or that load. So the one on the top left is the grid tied as the utility. Those are the ones that we would have interest. Those are the ones where we would want uh, to make sure that these installations are safe and all. Thank you, Kim, next slide. So we have processes uh, that was basically put together to be able to ensure that we can have uh, authorized grid connections. So the first one above basically at a very, very high level, you'll have an application process on the top left and uh, under number one, uh, which involves an application. And the application could uh, come through our contact center, it could come through a website, which I'll provide at the end on the last slide. Uh, so there was a request for applications uh, would come from those channels. Uh, it would get processed uh, in terms of advisors then doing the relevant screening to make sure you're in the right tariff um, and then facilitating the process for you to, to have a quotation. Quotation will involve basically due diligence that we would do on the network side to ensure that we have adequate capacity to host that generator. Uh, and then in terms of the engineering and the pricing people to make sure that we can correctly uh, uh, coach you. If you're a larger customer, we would work on actual and up to 350 we've had standard connection uh, quotation uh, charges. Uh, 
the customer will be quoted. If he pays, then we just need to make sure all the agreements are in place. And the necessary registrations with NASA would be in place before we then would facilitate uh, the grid connection. Part of the requirements would be an EGI, which is uh, a document that traditionally for loads, we would look just at uh, 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 a COC. Uh, here we'd look for an EGI in addition uh, to just the COC. That would be part of the requirements before we energize. And by the end of the month, if everything is loaded correctly, the customer should then receive uh, an accurate uh, first bill. Um, so on the ESKIM side and on the customer side, I think um, once the first bill is received accurately, then that process is then complete. The process at the bottom basically says if you, for some reason, are unauthorized, the connection is not authorized, then uh, either you come forward or we would identify you uh, and then we would engage you. Uh, and during that engagement, we'll inform you about the generator. You would have a choice uh, to move that uh, system off grid totally as a standalone system, or you could start an application process whereby uh you would move to the process i've just indicated and in the point one above uh to be able to go through the normal application due diligence to get that connection authorized uh, connection the other option that we're finding now is some customers may indicate if our meter readers will ever see those pv systems that's not listed uh, when the investigation is done, would indicate that it is, like in the previous slide, a standalone system. Then there would be a declaration form that we would expect that customer, or uh, that would be the customer declaring that that system is standalone, it's not connected to the grid, doesn't pose any risk, and should it then decide uh, to connect on the grid, he would inform us again. So that's something that we would have a declaration form signed. And that would result basically in either two scenarios, either a normalized connection going through the process one above or an off-grid system. I suppose the third scenario is uh, a declaration uh, if it's already off-grid. Thanks, Kim. Next slide. Kim, I tried to explain as much from the previous slide because I suppose the audience is going to struggle to read that. So basically, that was the number one in the previous slide where we would look at initiating the application. If I missed anything out uh, and making sure the necessary screening is done, I think we've covered it in the previous slide. And this slide number two basically is preparing the code where the necessary due diligence is done, especially. For those applications greater than 350, we would require to do an actual cost and our pricing and engineering people will, will look at what's uh, required in terms of quoting the customer. Um, and then the customer will be provided with that quote, which in number three, if accepted, process continues. And then the necessary agreements uh, could be signed if all the necessary uh, registrations and documents are in place in terms of uh, NASA and so forth, so that we can proceed with connection. Uh, yeah, and then connect the customer to the grid. Yeah, so internally, we just gotta make sure the correct handovers are done uh, with the customer and with uh, the local CNC to make sure that we're handing over a safe connection to the grid. Uh, customer is connected. Yeah, and then that's the first bill. So that's just an expansion of what was number one on the previous slide. Thank you. So options. So what we've done, we managed to put together last year is for the customers that's on the low voltage, uh, typically those uh, generators up to 350 kVA. Um, 
connections up to 350 kV. We have put together what is standardized uh, charges for quotations, standardized uh, charges for um, connection fees, and then uh, for metering cost uh, cases where the customers are exporting, there'd be no reprogramming. Uh, and then the ones with non-exporting or possibly uh, we would look at the metering cost as per the national pricing, uh, average price. Yeah. So these are basically, we have options for urban and rural, and you can see those prices for the quotations for the ones up to 350, we have standardized and simplified. We try to simplify the process and the costing we've standardized. So these are things we've put in place basically to make the LV connections more simpler and more standardized. Uh, been through extensive training program, we're still going through training. I think there's a lot of changes that have to happen in the space to make this possible. Uh, so while it's excitement in the market, I think for the distributed uh, utility, there's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes. And for the smaller municipalities, I suppose this may be a challenge. The system, the process, the metering, the uh, contracts, the billing system, everything was designed for electricity to flow in one direction. Now you have to then reorganize, upgrade, make changes to be able to enable um, electricity to flow in both directions. And so that can be metered and be costed accordingly uh, for the customer. Uh, traditionally, we've had uh, solutions for IPPs, we've had contracts for like 200 page plus documents for, for generated connections, which we've also managed to simplify as sub supplementary agreements. Uh, so we try to simplify what we can for the prosumer and we try to standardize what we can in terms of uh, standardized cost and simplify for the smaller applications of the LV. So this is the work that we've done last year. The tariffs, um, are structured according to time of use because our our revenue is structured uh, to a large extent and our purchasing of revenue is done on a time of use basis. We've got to make sure that we don't negatively impact uh, the revenue which would be impacted by the loss, but how we manage this is has to be done on a time of use basis. So hence, it would be a requirement for time of use tariff and uh, yeah, so these are the things uh, that we've put in place. You can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I think we spoke about the tariffs applicable. We would have tariffs for rural, which is Rotoflex or Rotoflex Gen for urban, Miniflex, Miniflex Gen, uh, which would be the tariffs, basically the time of use tariffs applicable if customers want to uh, connect. Um, there would also be uh, a use of system agreement for an offsetting or banking for customers who want to export. In terms of tariff uh, uh, conversions, customers that are on non-time of use would be required to basically uh, have a tariff conversion and for customers who are applying, uh, there would be uh, no tariff fee uh, in this regard uh, for that conversion. There would be upfront quotation fees that we spoke about. The larger ones, basically, there'll be uh, a cost estimate fee. And then for the smaller ones, less than 350, up to 350, there'll be the standard fee we spoke about. Connection charges will be actual cost for the ones greater than 350 on the MB network. And then the LB side, it would be those standard fees that we spoke about. Okay, next slide, Kim. So the new services that we would offer in terms of, you know, from the grid perspective, the grid services would be where you could use, utilize the grid as a battery. And that basically means 
on a time of use basis, you could use the grid as three separate batteries, which is be a peak standard and off peak battery. Depending on the period that you would generate your surplus uh, that you'd export on the grid, you would then deposit that energy into that peak standard or off peak battery. And end of the month, depending on your consumption, you could draw off that battery to offset your, your bill. So that's a service that we would offer. It comes with the admin fee. There would also be a use of system fee uh, uh, as well. Uh, so there's a supplementary agreement for use agreement with an admin fee, supplementary agreement for offsetting. So offsetting means you can offset on a month to month basis, which means end of the month, the battery discharges uh, and it'll start from zero in the next month. If you want to carry over that energy, uh, within the financial year, then there's another service agreement which comes with the admin fee where you could carry it over. So that battery will only discharge at the end of the financial year, ESCOM financial year. So offsetting and banking is options that you would have uh, to export your surplus. It comes in the fee, like when you go deposit in the bank, whether you want a 30 day account or you want a savings account that be involved. And then wheeling is also an option for you to export. It's available on the MV. Uh, so basically, uh, medium voltage uh, supplies uh, would be able to qualify for wheeling. And then, like I said, for exporting as well, there'll be use of system charges uh, and supplementary agreement that goes with that. Thank you. Next slide, uh, Kim. Yeah, so this was just explaining the offsetting and banking. So Essentially, like I said, you know, it's a credit, it's on a one-on-one one-to-one -one basis. So one peak unit you put into the uh, off for offsetting, you can then use that to offset one unit. So it's based on the units, number of units you put in your peak, you can offset up to your up to your consumption level, peak, standard or off peak. Okay. Banking, we said you can carry it over. And then the admin charges we spoke about, they will have admin charges. So on the LV network, you are limited to 75% of your connection size in terms of maximum export capacity from your data. Thank you, next slide. So in summary, um, I think what we're saying here is Eskim has processes. We have dedicated teams to facilitate customers with the self generation applications in respective provinces. It's taken us a lot of time. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, the, the readiness is something that is a journey. It's not a push button today and tomorrow you have all your processes in place and tomorrow you have all your people trained. These things take time. Uh, and I think we've come a long way in this regard. Uh, so our teams are in place. They are dealing with the applications, the rotations. So there is a lot of change management. So historically for the last 75 or 100 years, this is how we've done business in one direction. Now we're embracing change to be able to do business in both directions. The self-generation uh, connections, we just got to make sure that they meet all the technical and regulatory requirements. Uh, the speed at which we we can deliver these things uh, yeah is basically also influenced by the time that you need to get your respective uh, approvals and registrations in place so that also then stops the process until we have those registrations in place and that adds on to the time it takes from the time you apply till you get your connection um, the website I mentioned earlier on is a lot of information that we've put on the website. We've created a, a page, uh, the SSEG landing page, um, where you can get all the latest information. So it provides more detail to what's already in the presentation in terms of the process. There's also a link to a help desk that can also then facilitate with the respective provinces uh, assisting to that. I think that's the long and short. That's the last slide. Is there one more slide? Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Salesh. Um, I think the insights into these processes and more especially the tariff structures are incredibly important uh, to both industry players and end users alike. Um, and I know there's, uh, you don't hear this very much, but, and with all of the spotlight of ESCOM, just know that we as industry appreciate the efforts uh, coming out of ESCOM uh, and should continue to work together to share information so the rest of the industry understands better and to improve the relationship between ESCOM and the solar PV industry. So thank you for that. Uh, the next panelist we have is Ms. Uh, Mary Hall, a professional engineer who leads the city of Cape Town's renewable energy and energy efficiency facilitation and promotion team, uh, enabling a wide range of projects within the sustainable energy markets department. Mary, you have a very long title. You need to start sharing some of that work with your team. Um, with the aim to further uh, the uptake of small-scale embedded generation, Mary will be sharing her presentation on the SSEG activities of the city of Cape Town. Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Navesh, and thanks um, to Sapia and the team for having me on today. And it's great to have such a, a big audience from a wide range of people who are really interested in renewable energy. So yeah, excited for the discussion. Thanks, Kim. So city of Cape Town, you can go, Kim. We do, we, we are really supportive of green technologies. And I think the, that's really epitomized in the development of the sustainable energy markets department, which is a fairly new department in the city. And it's the department that I'm, I'm in. And we're really looking at how uh, the future landscape of energy is really changing and how can the city make sure that we are part of that transition and not, not stopping it and also not gonna be left behind. So facilitating and promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency, is a key part of that in across the different sectors. Thanks, Kim. As well as developing large scale generation of our own. Um, so looking at ground mounted PV, for example, and then also improving our own um, efficiency of our municipal buildings. And then um, the, the low income communities is obviously a crucial area for, for municipalities that we have to address. So it's about equitable provision of energy and trying to eradicate energy poverty. So we in Cape Town, we've got a really, um, we've got a lot of electrification, so almost 98%, I think, um, but there is still energy poverty. So it's looking at ways that we can improve that through energy efficiency, um, through other renewable energy projects, for, um, et cetera. And then the buildings work, which I will touch on again, is also um, a really crucial part of our objectives. Thanks. And then the data side is, a, is, is integral to how we actually meet our objectives. And this is linked to our climate change objectives and our modeling scenarios. So we have a team dedicated to, to that work as well. Thanks, Kim. And, and a lot of this is, is about connecting to people like yourself. So connecting with businesses and citizens and to try and unlock some of these barriers. And I think we that's why we're having these discussions today. So I think, you know, I've, I've, I've come in, in uh, third here, but I think the, the messages from de Villiers and Selesh are really about, you know, there are certain stops in place, but we have to try and innovate to, to overcome hurdles and to work together. Because I think if, if business is working against the municipality or, or the grid operators working against business, then we, we're not going to, we're not going to achieve what we set out to achieve. Thanks. So the city of Cape Town, together with the other three large metros in South Africa, Johannesburg, Chwane, and Etiquini, have made very ambitious uh, targets of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. And this is part of the C40 deadline 2020, which is about the, uh, which comes out of the Paris Agreement, uh, urging cities and countries to, to increase their, their targets of, around climate action. One really important part of this goal is the is around buildings, and we've addressed there are two there are a number of buildings targets, but the one that I've mentioned here is around carbon uh, net zero carbon new buildings by 2030, and I think why that's so important is that a municipality has has more control over building development than it does over other elements, and so and it's also especially for Cape Town, it's it's the area that has is responsible for the most. Uh, carbon emissions. So buildings is a really important area. And I think that's why um, in, uh, embedded generation or distributed generation, particularly rooftop PV is so important. 
because it, it plays into this, these targets, both of carbon neutrality, but also of the, the new buildings and the existing buildings targets as well. Thanks. So next one. So what does the city of Cape Town um, allow in terms of small scale embedded generation? Um, thank you, Kim. I think what's important for us is just this map firstly, is that in the geography of the city of Cape Town, we actually are only, we only supply a portion. I mean, it is the larger portion, but we, but both city of Cape Town and ESCOM are service providers in that um, geographic area of city of Cape Town. So there are some challenges where we have, you know, two just two different grid operators or two different suppliers right next to each other, and they have different, you know, tariffs and different um, setups. But I think, you know, Celeste and I are on the same page, but hopefully we can, you know, get aligned so that our customers have the same, um, it's, you know, it's a streamlined process. Um, so just can, you can move on there. Thanks, uh, Kim. And again, so the small scale embedded generation refers to power generation under one megawatt. And I know we've already talked about that um, increase and I can, I, you know, we can certainly talk about it more, but I think for now, until we get the gazetted, um, you know, gazetted information back from D D R DMRE and also the process of how this increased license threshold is going to work. At the moment, um, SSEG is still one megawatt or less. And it's um, for generations such as solar PV and wind turbines. And it's for systems that are situated on residential, commercial or industrial sites. And that's also where that um, electricity is consumed. Most of the electricity is consumed on site, um, but there are times when generation may exceed consumption and that's when there might be reverse flow or feed in. So these systems could be grid tied, so connected to the city of Cape, the city of Cape Town's electricity grid and have this reverse uh, or feed in, like I said, or you could block the feed in through reverse flow blocking. Alternatively, you could have an off grid system. And I think um, de Villiers made the really good point that, that this is not something that we really want to, as an industry, we want to promote because looking after the grid and making sure that the grid is dynamic and a sort of future proofed grid is where we want to head. So uh, you can do off grid, but it's not, yeah, I don't, I think it's a bit of a short, short-term scenario. Thanks, Kim. Um, so the, I think it's important to note that while the systems aren't perfect and we still have, you know, we've got a long way to go to, to get to where China is, although as you noted, there might be some, some other things at play there. But I think, you know, we, although we've got a long way to go, the city of Cape Town is seen as a leader in SSEG uptake. We were the first municipality to develop um, SSEG guidelines in South Africa. Next. Um, we were also one of the first to allow bi-directional metering, so both import and export of electricity off, uh, off, a, off, off an earth. And then the, the automated billing that allows customers to purchase and sell electricity. And I think quite often people think those are the same thing, the bi-directional metering and the billing. But as the utility, they're quite different um, mechanisms. And I think quite often it's the billing side that is sometimes more complicated than the, the technical side. Thanks. Next. And then on the SSCG tariffs. So we have created SSCG tariffs that do credit consumers for excess generation. Thanks. I think we've touched on quite a lot of why registration is so important. And I'm glad that I, I wasn't the one that had to had to raise it because of course it is something that is, is really important for us. And as well as the sort of other regulations and bylaws, and I think um, de Villiers and Selesh both kind of put this quite quite succinctly, but it is it is the law that we need to have all generation equipment <coughs> registered with the, the utility or the grid operator. Thanks. And this, as has been already suggested, is to um, is is basically for safety. So it's safety for both staff working on the grid as well as um, safety from building occupants. And also, again, um, De Villiers mentioned the the potential for insurance risks. Thanks, Kim. Um, and I think the quality of supply has been touched on as well, but, I th but the process of registering is, is really important for the grid operator to know that you have, you know, that you're putting 
uh, high quality electricity into the network. So there's um, kind of potential metering and billing issues that might happen if that's not the case. And it's also really around managing the network. So the city needs to understand electricity usage so that they can maintain and manage the network. And it's not only about what you're feeding into the grid. The sun, you know, PV only operates while the sun is shining. So if you have a lot of PV in one part of the grid and the sun goes down and suddenly all those people are drawing their entire demand from the grid, you know, that you get that kind of duck curve scenario that's happening in California. And it's important for the utility to actually be able to manage that um, so that we can avoid challenges there. And I think for a municipality, the challenge is often not at a macro scale, it's right on a micro scale. So we might have substations that are at the end of a line in an affluent area with lots of PV and those substations are taking strain. So it's really, it's important that the city knows about those, those um, systems and they can manage the network appropriately. Thanks. So I'm gonna just share this video with you. It's quite, it's very short, but it just uh, really highlights the importance of registering, thanks. Sorry, Kim, I don't have any sound. I'm not sure if you have sound on your side. Kim, the sound doesn't seem to be working. Uh, Kim, under the share option, you should say share with sound just next to the share video. See if you can select uh, the sound, and switch it on. Sorry about this. It was working when we tried it earlier. Thanks for uh, we'll um, hopefully Kim can sort that out. Thanks. Kim, I think it's a Zoom setting, not a YouTube setting. I'm sorry, guys, I can't seem to get this to work. Okay, no problem. We can then just skip this, um, but maybe you can share in the chat the, the link to the YouTube and people can watch it in their own time. It's a great, um, just really succinct uh, message on, on why registration is important, but we can move on then. Thanks. So you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Kim. <clears throat> So what, um, what are we doing in my team to try and facilitate SSEG uptake? We are trying to develop uh, easy to use information and guidance through booklets and updating of websites and, uh, and information sessions together with groups like Sapphire and Green Cape to try and get information out there. I think that that's really important, especially for the users. Um, I'd be interested to know what the makeup of this audience is, but I think quite often, we are preaching to the converted, you know, we're talking to installers and we're talking to people who are doing the right thing. And often it's people that don't know or they kind of have got stuck uh, in the process that are the ones that we really need to be talking to. Thanks, Kim. Um, we are also working with our electricity colleagues to develop a streamlined on, um, online registration process. And I know this is a long time coming and it's something that we're really trying to get through. Um, it's much easier said than done, and the city is kind of a big beast. It's got a lot of back-end stuff that we have to connect to. So um, it's not going as fast as we want it to, but it is something that we are trying to push hard on. Um, yeah, so I know that a lot of people will be happy when that's up and running, but it's something that, that is on our priority list. Thanks. 
Um, we did have a registration awareness campaign about two years ago now, which I'll touch on again, but that was again, trying to reach out to property owners to just make them aware of the fact that registration is so important. Thanks. And then we want to really continue to promote quality assurance programs. And here we are with SAPVIA and obviously the SAPVIA PV green card is a system that, that is, is such a quality assurance program that helps uh, make, make uh, gives us comfort that the installers are doing the right thing and the systems that are getting installed are, are what they say they are. Thanks. And then um, in parallel to all of this, we're also exploring alternative financing mechanisms or other ways that we can uh, promote SSEG uptake, particularly in the residential sector. So we have, and supporting the residential sector. I think for a lot of commercial companies, SSEG or, or solar PV already makes sense. And so they are gonna, you know, the, the hurdles there are around system size restrictions and that sort of thing. Whereas on the residential side, um, a lot of the uh, hurdles are around financing and um, maybe ease of, of implementation. So we're trying to look at systems like the property assessed clean energy uh, financing mechanism, whereby, uh, for example, a, a system could be paid off through a municipal rates collection mechanism with outside in, uh, bodies that are doing the financing and installing and maintenance and all of that. It's quite tricky. There's a lot of legal hurdles. Um, and so it might not look like that when we finally get something up and running, but we are looking at ways that we can, can do that. And I think, you know, the ESCOM, the ESCOM scenario of, of consolidating LV customers is also an interesting one. And that might be something that we could also look into as to how you can use, use the kind of consolidation mechanism to make things a bit easier. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this because now it's quite dated, um, but we did, as I said, we had a registration campaign and we will continue to send this message out. So you might see something similar coming out quite soon. But again, it's about educating the public who may not know about the importance of registration. So next. Um, and what we saw last time, thanks, Kim was that there was a big jump in the increase of registration uh, during this during this registration period. So the number of the total number of registrations received to date went up by you know 350 percent um, after the registration process or during the registration process. So I think that that's an important calling card that people often want to do the right thing, but they either don't know or they are lazy or they're kind of leaving it to the last minute. But I think it's um, that was that was quite an important message for us. Thanks. And so then, just a little bit on tariffs, and I'm not going to dwell on this too long because I know we have quite a, a you know an audience from all around South Africa. But I think it's important just to have a quick understanding of how the tariffs work in Cape Town, um, and they are different, obviously, for different municipalities. Uh, but I think a lot of them are similar. So they're in the SSEG2 tariff. So this is the second, sort of a second major iteration of the tariff. And it's really trying to align better with the, the other home user tariffs. So the, the other consumption tariffs. So there's a service charge of 226, uh, just over two, uh, nearly 230 rand a month, which is the same or similar to the home user tariff. And then there's an inclining block tariff of consumption and a feed-in tariff of around 73 cents. Um, I don't know what happened to the, <laughs> to the font there, but the, the um, industrial and commercial systems are similar, um, but obviously they are linked to their own uh, consumption tariffs. I think what's important is that when you are kind of thinking about tariffs, you have to also think about the point of view of the municipality, which is that we need to strike a balance between protecting municipal revenue and, ensure, and ensuring a viable case for SSEG customers. And that first part about municipal revenue is not because we're trying to make money, we are not a money-making enterprise, but it's about equitable distribution. And you can't have a scenario where SSEG customers are in sort of in principle getting uh, subsidized by non-SSEG customers. So everyone needs to pay for their portion or their use of the grid. And I think that's been mentioned in the previous speakers as well, that that's really important. Thanks, Kim. 
And just to, to kind of, th th this is again reinforced by a recent study done by Sustainable Energy Africa, in which they did a bunch of modeling and looked at uh, SSEG tariffs around the country. And they recommended that a sensible uh, residential SSEG tariff has a fixed charge of around 200 to 400 Rand a month. And bearing in mind that that you know, 200 Rand still is not cost, fully cost reflective for a lot of municipalities. So it's still being kind of subsidized by other mechanisms in, in the sort of city mm -hmm. fiscus. But uh, 200 to 400 Rand a month is, is round about what your grid charges um, would come to. With an energy charge that is unchanged, that should be the same as any other, any other consumption charges. And then a feed-in tariff that is in line with avoided purchases. So in our case, that's the avoided costs um, from ESCOM. Thanks. And I'm not going to dwell on this graph, but this is a graph that comes out of that study. And you can see that they, and these are real, these come from real um, SSEG tariffs around South Africa. And the, the ones on the top, so we've got their Metro 2 and Intermediary City 1, they are un favorable for customers because the payback on your system is more than uh, 10 years and it's re revenue positive for the municipality versus the yellow one at the bottom, which is unfavorable for the municipality because it's a negative revenue for municipality, but would be favorable to customers. And what we're really trying to get is towards that blue line in the middle, which is a, a more revenue neutral scenario where um, the the customers aren't sort of worse off and the city is not worse off. And, and city of Cape Town is around that kind of blue mark. I think that blue mark is, that blue one is actually Etequini, but we are also similar to that. Thanks. So the city of Cape Town's registration um, system is relatively simple. I think, uh, you know, uh, de Villiers also identified the, the time it takes. And I think, you know, that it does take some time. So people need to be prepared for that. And we are, you know, we are working at trying to streamline these processes. And the main thing is that your, your, all your applications need to be correct at the get-go, because that's actually the biggest bottleneck, is that there's some problem with the information provided to the city, and that kind of then stalls the whole process. So I think if, if I can implore you to make sure that all your, you know, I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed, um, then that really helps with the, the process. So just going through this, you visit the website, you download the relevant forms, you complete the forms. So all the orange here is what the customer needs to do. Um, if you need to get written cl um, clearance from other city departments, you need to get that. But that's really only if you're doing something sort of totally out there like wind turbines on a residential property or um, you know PV that's really extending beyond your roof. So mostly for rooftop PV, you don't have to do that. Um, then you need to get your uh, application forms submitted. And then once that has been approved, you get a permission to install letter from the city. So all of this has to happen before you've actually installed your system. Very important, before you've installed your system. Thanks, Kim. And once you have got that um, permission to install letter, you then go ahead and install your system and test it. You then complete the supplemental mental contract. Thanks, Kim. And that's a contract between the building owner and the city. And I think that's also important, which I'll touch on again. Um, and then all of that information and the commissioning documentation goes back to the city where a metering quotation letter is issued. This is in the case of a um, feed-in system, grid-tied feed-in system. Uh, the customer pays for the meter. Next, the meter gets installed. And your commissioning approval is then um, given. And where appropriate, you will be put onto the correct SSEG tariff. And, and, and that's it. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a change, a big change to your SSEG system, you will have to go through this again. Thanks. And then what happens if people don't register their system? And this is what has been happening. Um, and it's, it, it becomes quite a problem. And so there is an illegal process for unregistered systems. And that's why we really want customers to register their systems without having to kind of embark on this illegal process. So if you, if you do have an illegal system and you haven't uh, kind of got, it, got your application in time, you will be liable for a service fee of um, just over 8,000 Rand. And if you then do not uh, disconnect your system within five days and do the application within a month, you then risk your um, electricity being disconnected from your net, from the network. Um, 
we do also do GIS or aerial surveys. So it's quite, you know, it is easy to see where PV systems are. You can't really hide a PV system in your garage. So um, yeah, please get your systems registered. Thanks, Kim. As I mentioned, we do aerial surveys. So this is uh, in Constantia. You can see Constantia Village there. Thank you, which is a big, a big system. And I think, you know, De Villiers was being quite nice saying that 50% of our systems are unregistered, but actually it's probably closer to 60% of our systems that we identified through the aerial survey are unregistered. Are unregistered. Um, we are, I think we're getting closer to the 50% mark with the increase in registrations, but it's still not ideal. Um, and we are going through the process of, of you know, I, that, that illegal process that I mentioned, which is not fun, um, but it is something that has to be done. Thanks. And then I think just to sort of to end off with, with the numbers that we're talking about. So we have, an, uh, in terms of approved grid tied installations, which is only a subset of systems, but in terms of that, we have uh, just over 1,500 registered systems or authorized systems. And that's about 58 MVA or 58 megawatts. What's interesting though, is that the, the prime, primarily the number is in resident, small residential systems, whereas the big kind of installed ones are obviously on the commercial industrial side. And then that, those numbers versus what we have on the aerial survey is we think there are over 4,000 systems um, that are out there, but those do also include sort of off-grid systems. Uh, again, the majority is obviously smaller residential systems. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think just before I hand over, what I wanted to take the opportunity in this audience is also just to kind of ask questions to you, which is, you know, some of some of the challenges that we have are around installers not giving their customers the right information. And I think, you know, all installers going broke or installers um, disappearing, and then we get left with customers who are very angry and don't want to go through the process because they're going through a legal battle with their installers. So that's one major issue that I'm hoping, you know, Sapvia and this group is, is working towards. And then the other major challenge is around um, change of ownership of homes. So, you know, a system is on a roof and the, the original owner put the system on and then suddenly a new owner is liable for a registration process that they weren't aware of. So that's another big challenge that I'm, I think the industry needs to start tackling. Um, but thanks. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, and apologies for the technical glitch. We will send out the link uh, to the video to participants. Uh, the city of Cape Town has always been a front runner for all things small scale embedded generation. Uh, and you continue to set an example for other municipalities to understand the benefit of increasing small scale embedded generation, both responsibly and sustainably. Uh, I think now that we've covered the policy framework and the associated processes, Let's focus on our, our attention on Mr. Fourier van Skalpvik, uh, a, a Master of Engineering graduate with years of experience in renewable energy and solar PV specifically. Having worked on the draft stands 10142-1-2 for a long time, uh, I think Fourier will be covering the, the, the specific technical requirements for small scale embedded generators uh, from a national standard perspective. Over to you, Fourier. Great. Uh, thank you, Navesh, and thank you for Sapphire for making, uh, creating this opportunity. I think when I looked at the agenda, there's really very good, valid uh, topics discussed, and I think there's so much more that should be discussed. But uh, let's focus on the topic that I'm presenting today, which is the SANS 101.42, part one, section two. Okay, Kim, you can go to the next one. Okay, so I will just start off with the, the background, just so that we understand where does the standard fit in? Why is it necessary? Um, yeah, what's the implication for the industry once the standard has been published? Um, then we'll just look at the status quo in terms of where are we now with the standards and the possible next steps. And then we'll um, round off with some take home messages. All right. So first of all, the SANS 101.42-1, for those who don't know, this is the Bible according to which electricians install or do electrical installation work. Now, this specific standard um, is the wiring of premises, so it's fixed installations, and it's for low voltage. Low voltage as in less than 1,000 volts AC or 1,500 volts 
BC. Anything beyond that, then other standard starts to kick in. This is also typically where the small scale embedded generation uh, applications uh, uh, start to kick in as well. So when it comes to the requirements for embedded generation, now the term which was used in the previous version of this document was co-generation. It was not clear or not included. Uh, I think the latest version talks about parallel generation. So what does that mean? As soon as you install some form of power generation, which is running in parallel with your grid. So we're talking about grid tight systems or hybrid systems uh, or synchronous uh, systems. These, these, these are the type of applications where the standard does not specify what is necessary. And for that reason, the SANS 101 for two, part one, section two, which is the requirements for low voltage SECG installations. I just summarized the title. It's a very long title as it stands. Now the focus, like I said, is for small scale. Uh, I think when we started with the document, it was actually open to all sizes, but for now it is for systems less than a megawatt. Uh, and keep in mind, the emphasis is a lot on solar PV. It tried to make provision for other generations, but PV is the main focus. Okay, out of interest, this document is more than five years. I confirmed today, it's almost eight years in the making. Um, so I, I did make a, make a point that it's due for review soon. So the point I'm trying to make is that they were trying to get this document out as soon as possible, um, but it, uh, we do foresee that soon it will be reviewed so that we can include the new technologies and new changes. Next one. Okay, so again, uh, Mary spoke about the, the documentation that they provide for the public to inform them. This is also coming from one of their presentations. So thank you for, for City of Cape Town. But just to illustrate exactly where does the SANS 10142 part one section two fit in. Okay, so the next uh, next slide or the next presentation. So the NRS 097-2-1, I know that uh, De Villiers spoke about this. This has to do with the utility interface. This is typically where we have uh, certified inverters. And this is to make sure that the system or the inverter complies and would be able to interconnect to the utility. Next one. Okay, and this is where the SANS 10142 part one section two comes in. It has to do with the installation from where it physically connects to the DB, to the inverter, from the inverter to the panels, and then the connections to the batteries and other forms of, of connection. So that's that's the part that we're trying to, to cover. And then the next one. Okay, this is the NRS 097-2-3. This is where the 25 and the 75% will come from. And this has to do with the network capacity. So you can see these different, uh, uh, it's actually two guideline documents. It's not national standards, uh, which utilities then enforce by making it part of their bylaws. And you can see how they have each of them uh, a specific role. One has to do with the network capacity, the 2-3. 2-1 has, has to do with utility interface, that's the synchronization requirements, and then the actual installation requirements is where the SANS then comes in. Next one. Okay, so what's the implication for the industry? So I think the, the bottom line is this document is long overdue and is really critically needed. So we really need to get this document out, out as soon as possible so that we can give some guidance and clarity on what needs to be done and implemented. So one of the things one of the big benefits if we can have this document out, it, it will address a lot of gray and unknown areas in terms of uh, uh, including protective equipment, uh, conductor selection and sizing, labeling, earthing, uh, the test report that doesn't cover a lot of solar PV aspects or, or, or a better generation aspects at this stage, as well as lightning protection. So, um, yeah, obviously this will increase safety for the installations. Um, we had the privilege to inspect and look at a lot of solar PV installations that's been done. And because there's no clarity on the standards, I don't know why it happens like this, but people say, if there's no standard, then anyone can install. That's not true, okay? The law is very clear. It has to be done by a registered electrician. Uh, and because there's these gray areas or nothing has been said, uh, it needs to be addressed with the standard. Okay, so we want to address the, uh, improve the safety. And I want to just emphasize so that we, understand the position of the standard. The standard is specifying the minimum safety requirements. Okay, so it's not a performance, it's not trying to address the performance aspects. This is where something like the PV green card and the quality assurance comes in. So it's really specifying the minimum safety requirements so the installation is done uh, uh, safely, but also minimum because we want to reduce the cost. Okay, because if we can just add up and all on the requirements at the end of the day, it's not feasible and it could kill the business case. And that's not the intention of the document. Okay, it will help level the playing field for the installers. Why do I say that? Um, the unfortunate thing is you have installers that want to do it the right way according to best practice. And then you have those that's taking shortcuts. And, and the shortcut ones are unsafe and this is obviously a problem. 
Um, yeah, keep in mind, not all aspects are addressed in detail. For example, hybrids and storage systems are not properly covered in detail. So I foresee with the feedback that we've got now that it covers some of the points and new technologies where we start to use microinverters and, and uh, smart uh, optimizers and all of these things, uh, that's still something that needs to be considered uh, going forward. Next one. Okay, so what's the status quo and possible next steps? So the draft standard has been circulated for public uh, comment for the second time. Um, and the closing date for comments was now recently early in June. The working group will convene end of this month to start processing the comments. Um, the feedback I got is that the intention would be to go through all this or process the comments uh, by the end of the year. Um, and then once the comments are actually addressed, uh, it will go out for publication. So that's the intention. So the possible timeline, and this is, I just want to make clear, this is not SAB's timeline. This is my personal opinion timeline, is that by the end of the year, we will have the comments addressed to a large extent and maybe have it published mid uh, next year. So this is, don't take me on it. But yeah, every time when we talk about it, the date shifts on. So a few points just to remember is that the SANS 101.42 part one, section two, um, it complements a base document. What do I mean? What do I mean with this? The existing SANS 101.42 part one stays and will be applicable. And there are already a lot of solar related requirements within this document. So um, it, the, the issue is, is the embedded generation. So this is where dash two or section two comes in is to complement the base document. It will increase the safety. That's ultimately what we want to achieve. And this will also, like I say, level out the playing field because now it's like to compare apples with apples, everybody has to do it the same way with installing the systems. Um, and like I said, in future, it will be updated and expanded further. Okay, there's just uh, my contact details. And then if there's any questions, um, we can discuss it. If we can't answer it today, we can take it on later on. Thank you very much for uh, a quick uh, presentation. Uh, I think with more and more installations going up every day, the technical compliance to ensure quality and safety becomes more and more important, mm. right? Uh, so we look forward to having this completed uh, and implemented with the haste that, it's, that that's required. And thank you for all of the efforts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Kore. Uh, our last presentation will be done by uh, Dr. Silas Muladzi, the Sustainable Energy Specialist at Selga, having a PhD in renewable energy and much experience with renewable energy in South Africa, Silence, Silas offers expert advice on various policy, legislative and strategic matters, advocating and promoting renewable energy at local government. Uh, today, Silas will be presenting the municipal support program that Selga offers to municipalities wanting to develop their own processes for small scale embedded generation. Over to you, Silas. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Program Director. Um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Silas Mlausi. I work for um, uh, South African Local Government Association, responsible for renewable energy, as well as energy efficiency. Um, the um, presentation covers, basically, I'm gonna do the background quickly. Um, the um, program, the support program that uh, we offer to the municipalities, as well as um, the significance of the Southern SSCG system, which is well, um, fairly covered by uh, Mary from the city of Cape Town. Um, some of the SSCG opportunities, and I will basically conclude thereafter. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, just to give you a brief background in terms of um, the um, energy summit that that like hosted in March 2018, where we were redefining the energy future for the local government in South Africa, and there were some um, high-level outcomes from the um, conference. Um, some of them has been uh, the recognition and acknowledgement of the um, self-supply, self-generation. Um, from uh, customers that um, these can play a significant role in um, stabilizing um, energy um, capacity in South Africa. And also the uh, commitment that um, was made by the local government in terms of uh, changing their processes, um, the tariffs, um, the bylaws uh, to allow the decentralized um, generation, that is more scale embedded generation where customers um, can um, um, generate electricity for own use and um, sell the surplus back to the um, municipality. And also um, wanted to highlight that uh, 
South Africa, as we all know, with the huge um, electricity generation capacity of up to 45% of the total um, um, African, African continent, that um, we are um, highly dependent on fossil fuel resources or the plus or minus um, 40 uh, megawatts that we do have, which is mainly generated from fossil fuel resources. That is the statement of the problem. And that um, we are basically uh, one of the um, countries uh, with high solar irradiance as we're in the Southern Hemisphere, like many other countries in the, in, the, in the Southern Hemisphere. And also to indicate that the potential of solar irradiance that we have, uh, which is approximately um, 8.1 kilowatt hour per square meter per day, uh, which is massive and which can uh, translate to a total theoretical potential of over 7,000 terawatt hour per year. Then because of this potential that we have as a country, um, we, um, we expect um, a massive growth of uh, solar PV in the country um, as um, the regulatory environment is actually opening up for the penetration of uh, solar PV. Next slide. Okay. Um, what we have seen at this point in time is that uh, the energy sector, um, it is undergoing major transition, both at a global as well as at a national um, level, which we see the shift um, from a centralized um, model to a um, decentralized energy system. And we know that decentralized energy um, generation and supply option is becoming more and more um, competitive than the traditional uh, monopoly. Hence, um, this is because of, of various reasons, which one of them is the fact that uh, solar PV cost, as we all know, it is declining with time. And this makes it more competitive to the fossil fuels. Um, at the same time, from the research, innovation and development, we are seeing um, a huge um, increase and in improved um, efficiency in the solar photovoltaic, where now we have got some of the panels or systems that are actually even more than 20% efficient. And um, South Africa, we're basically one of the countries with, as I said, solar, solar, uh, high solar radiation. Because of this, uh, we expect uh, the growth, as I said, in the um, coming years. We also um, aware of the annual um, electricity tariff increase. Uh, we talk of 50%, 50, so 15% this year, with um, yeah, um, possibilities of another 15% next year. And this is not really um, good for the consumers. Um, load shedding, it is what we actually experience as I speak, we all know that. And as I said in, um, in a few seconds ago that uh, we are having this uh, favorable um, regulatory framework which is opening up. We uh, now know that uh, Schedule 2 of Lexus Regulation Act is actually going to um, have the threshold increased to um, up to 100 megawatts uh, for license exemption which is um, um, a very good and a favorable um, um, environment for the investors and also for the uh, local government. Um, the next slide. Um, this is, I think this is uh, well covered uh, by the previous uh, presenters. I'm not gonna um, waste time defining what is small scale embedded generation. It has been well defined. I basically prefer to go to the next slide. Um, the um, small scale embedded generation support program that we offer as, um, as, as the local government association, we do this in um, cooperation or partnership with the GIZ um, and the GMRE, Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. What we do is that uh, we provide um, technical support to municipalities, so those that wish to develop processes in order to accommodate small scale embedded generation in a safe and uh, financial sound manner. Uh, precisely because um, we have seen an increase in the installation of um, solar um, PV rooftop, uh, different customers that are basically not registered. And um, what we say is that uh, this will not help municipalities uh, by any chance. Um, it is best to develop processes in place and um, accommodate SSCG, allow customers to apply um, so that you can have um, the um, authority to approve or not approve the application and get to know and understand the generation capacity of small scale embedded um, generation that we have out there in different, uh, from different customers. So what we do is that uh, we um, take uh, municipality through various um, 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 items and activities um, in this um, um, program. Uh, this year, it was an eight-day program where we have yeah, taken multiple through various items 
And um, we've seen over the years that this support initiative has resulted in an increase in the number of municipalities that are now um, have the small scale expertise generation processes. And they are allowing application um, 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 system in place, which allow um, customers to apply and um, to be able to install solar PV. That is um, municipalities that do have the um, application forms, the SSAG tariffs, export tariffs, as we have seen, um, maybe from Stockholm kept on presenting um, the export tariff too, that uh, um, um, the state of, state of Cape Town has together with uh, the basic charge, which um, is what we are saying to municipalities that uh, you better um, adopt and accommodate small scale embedded generation because you are not going to stop this. It is inevitable. Customers um, are really noticing the decline in solar PV and they are um, opting to install solar uh, photovoltaic for own generation. Next slide, please. Um, this is basically to um, highlight um, from 2016 to 2020, June, the uptake of um, small scale embedded generation that I spoke to, looking at the green um, uh, color. Uh, 2016, there were 10 um, um, uh, municipalities that are allowing SSEG. Then by June 2020, we're sitting at uh, 56 uh, municipalities that do allow um, um, small-scale embedded generation in their municipal area. Um, the yellow um, color is basically tariffs that uh, by June 2020, we had um, 31 municipalities that um, um, had um, approved um, SSCG tariffs um, as a result of the intervention of this uh, particular program that we, we offer. Then the red color is basically the um, application, official application processes that um, have been developed as a result of the program where different municipalities um, have been able to make submission of these uh, processes to their councils um, and get um, approval uh, for the implementation of the of the program in their municipality. Next slide. Um, what we have done is that um, following the previous years of this support program, we have invited uh, municipalities to apply um, uh, for the participation uh, in the third round of this uh, support and help them to improve or uh, to establish um, their um, um, processes. Uh, prefer we gave preference to basically municipalities that had not yet received um, this support before because every now and then we do have other municipalities that have participated in the previous program and will also wish to be part of the current program mainly because they will want to bring other staff members to um, come and be trained um, in the um, implementation of this um, SSCG in the municipality. What uh, we have seen is that in this year, 2021, year 2021, 2022, um, SSCG support program, we have got uh, 27 new municipalities uh, partners that have been successful and um, they have, or they are on a continuous basis receiving this um, support um, um, program. Um, it was an eight day uh, training that took place uh, from 8 to um, 19 March 2021, where we have then trained, trained these 27 new municipalities plus additional plus or minus eight municipalities that were basically um, coming for the second time. Because as I said earlier, that uh, some municipalities prefer to attend this um, time and again, mainly to also gain more insight, um, more, um, um, knowledge, uh, and also a kind of a refresher um, um, kind of uh, uh, training uh, to them. Uh, we over and above this eight day training, we also offer the ongoing um, support additional training, which is um, the um, uh, SSG tariff and revenue um, impact training. Um, I noticed um, um, the different tariffs that uh, Mary indicated. That's exactly what we offer to these uh, municipalities how to. Um, develop um, sensible tariffs, tariffs that will ensure that uh, municipal revenue is not badly affected. And at the same time, the customers um, are fairly um, 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 compensated because if you don't compensate customers, some of them won't see the reason to uh, register their system with the municipality because they will be paying the uh, monthly um, basic uh, charge. Hence, the export tariff uh, has to be fair and um, has to be, of course, transparent and has to be reasonable 
hands, we call it flexible tariff. So it's a one week kind of a training that we offer as SSS tariff. We also offer a, a, another one, um, the grid impact study, as well as the bi bi-directional uh, metering. Um, we were intending to offer the normal um, SSCG um, tariff training in April, but due to um, some um, yeah, delays, we um, did not do it the way we, we usually do it. We then um, had to um, uh, redefine it and do it slightly different. But however, we're still gonna offer the great impact um, as well as the bi-directional in the next few months. Then the next slide um, talks about uh, the survey that we conducted um, last year where we um, um, uh, collected the data on the small scale embedded generation in different municipalities. This is the total SSG municipal 2020. We have seen um, 282 megawatts um, that um, um, have registered with the municipalities. We are mindful of the fact that there is a lot more. I think the SSCG uh, total installed capacity can be up to 1.3 gigawatt, but uh, these are the difference between 282 megawatt that we are reporting and the 1.3 gigawatt is mainly um, um, precisely of those that have not yet registered. Uh, yeah, um, which is um, yeah, a challenge. We've seen in terms of distribution um, around the province that Gauteng was actually, is actually leading with 1.9 megawatt followed by Western Cape and KZN. You will know that these are three provinces that are um, basically the economic um, hub of the, of the country. So this is basically to give you a sense of the registered installed uh, PV capacity up to June 2020, we're sitting at 282, but this is a way that uh, we seek to um, do it um, every year so that we can at the end of the day um, on a continuous basis, get an understanding of uh, the total installed capacity that are registered with the municipalities. Next slide. Um, I think um, um, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna really go through these opportunities. Uh, this, I think to a certain extent were basically covered uh, by the previous presenters. Uh, these are you know, opportunities in the SSCG, um, 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 uh, which I'm not gonna waste time. Maybe let's go to the, uh, maybe the last point that I may wish to um, highlight is the fact that uh, the small scale better generation electricity is basically tend to be cheaper uh, um, for the municipalities because the municipalities purchases, purchases it at a less tariff of around what we've seen for a case of city of Cape Town, 73 cents per kilowatt hour, and then sell, of course, to other consumers at a normal tariff of um, what um, um, over um, 150 um, cents per, 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 kilo, per kilowatt hour. So you municipality will buy it at a less um, tariff and then sell it at a normal tariff where it becomes cheaper for municipality to purchase electricity from SSCG. And I think the electricity that uh, the customers, is a surplus electricity that supply the customer would have then export to um, the municipal um, um, grid network um, um, as, as a result of being surplus. Yeah, and then it's beneficial to municipalities because they will then sell it at a, a, cheap, at a slightly, um, um, a normal tariff, which is higher than what they would have bought at, uh, at from the customer. Next slide. Um, these two, this is well covered by uh, Mary. I'm definitely not gonna yeah, waste time on this one. Uh, Mary covered it very well. Uh, we can move to the last slide, which is conclusion. Okay, in conclusion, what we are saying is that uh, we have seen in the transition that municipalities are basically well positioned to drive the local energy transition because they're at the center um, of um, uh, this um, transition between um, of energy from customers that uh, would uh, generate for own for self consumption and then uh, sell the surplus to 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 the municipal um, um, infrastructure. Um, articulation infrastructure. So also the fact that SSCG tariffs, uh, as I said, that uh, develop, they need to balance the interest of the municipality, that is revenue protection on one hand, but at the same time, need to ensure that uh, there is a fair compensation to the customers. And um, we have at this point, well, um, from June 2020, had 
um, 15 municipalities that are allowing the installation of uh, this um, small scale emergency management in their network, which we, uh, we have seen that is a, it was a huge increase from 41 municipalities in 2018 to over 50 in 2020. And we are also seeing that the enforcement uh, in terms of uh, um, the unregistered system, that uh, there must be a serious um, enforcement from different municipalities. Uh, Captain presented how they are uh, doing this, how they are ensuring that customers must register. And we are saying to other municipalities that uh, they need to learn uh, from uh, Cape Town, they need to learn how Cape Town is doing it, and they need to really um, exercise um, the, their bylaws and also the distribution network code to ensure that customers um, um, register with, with, with the MS municipalities. And um, lastly, we, we know that uh, the SSCG plays a um, critical role in the electricity value chain, in the electricity sector, in terms of uh, security to, to security of supply, uh, decentralization as part of energy transition, and also diversification of these um, energy resources. So we see the SSCG as a part of a um, critical component of electricity value chain in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silas. Um, as we go, as we grow the distributed generation market segment, uh, I think ensuring municipalities are trained uh, and capacity is built will go a long way in supporting the industry holistically. Uh, I know for as for Sapphire, we look forward to continuously supporting South on this initiative. Um, I think with that, colleagues, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, Kim, can I ask you to take down the slides? There are a number of questions. We're not going to be able to cover all of the questions. Uh, panelists, can I ask that you switch on your cameras? We've got five minutes. We're going to take a couple of the questions that are here uh, as rapid fire. Uh, and as I go through these questions, um, I see that some people are very angry. <laughs> so we're going to try to address the, the speakers, uh, participants, the, the speakers have um, made themselves available to respond to all of these questions in writing. So when you get the, the recording of the session and the uh, presentation, you'll also get the responses to all of the questions that we didn't manage to cover uh, here. Uh, but just uh, to, to pick a few, maybe to start, uh, Silesh, uh, Mary, both of you, there's a question that says, uh, would there be any reason for declining an application uh, of SSEG? Based on past experience, uh, have you declined any applications and what were the reasons why you would decline an application for, for small scale image generation? Okay. Thanks, uh, Nivation. Nivation applications that would be declined where we already have a framework would be related to cases where we would have challenges perhaps on the network with hosting capacity. It could be technical reasons, and it may not be economically viable for the customer if we had to upgrade uh, the network. So that could be the one area of decline. The other area of where we would decline would be in the residential space at this stage. We don't have a time of use tariff for the residential customers. Uh, we are waiting approval for NERSA. Uh, you know, I must be upfront and honest with this question is even when NESA does have, uh, does grant us permission, we still have to do due diligence in terms of our billing system ability to deal with volumes of data in half hourly basis. Uh, and those are the type of due diligence we need to, we cannot collapse our billing system when we start to put customers that are read every three months data read every three months, now every 30 minutes. So it has some implications on the billing system and those due diligence we are doing, uh, it may come at a cost to be able to upgrade these systems and those are due diligence that we would do. The, the third reason in that space that we would have to, to be practical is whether we would be able to cope with the volumes. Considering the volumes now, and, and I know De Villiers is quoting 10 months, so was, I can't remember the number was, was quoted early on. If we're struggling with the volumes now in terms of capacity to deal, the reality is that uh, we have to find innovative ways to handle these applications. You know, we need to look at ways of streamlining and automating, which we are looking into. 
So at this stage, the ones where we do have the framework, it's capacity, hosting capacity on the networks, where the framework is not available uh, at this stage for residential. Uh, I'm saying that there may be some other delays once the tariff is approved that we are working uh, towards. We're not ignoring it. We're looking at ways, and I think Mary also indicated that they're looking at ways of streamlining and so forth. So thank you, Salesh. Yeah. That, thank you so much. That. Mary, is there anything thanks. to add to that from a safety point of view? Um, thanks. I mean, I I'm not actually the person that receives the application, so I don't know. I have I, I don't know every single application that's ever come through the city. From my understanding, is we have if if this if it's compliant if the application is compliant you've got the right inverter you haven't gone over the size limitations um, and all of that I believe that we would not reject a um, an application I, I think the caveat being I don't know what happens with systems that are kind of at the end of a line or in a grid constrained scenario but I think in those in, in scenarios that I know that that has happened, uh, customers have chosen to put on batteries, for example, and then they've actually added to the kind of to the grid um, stability element. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we've ever rejected a, a compliance system. Good to know. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, De Villiers, uh, I think there's always been this concern about small scale embedded generation versus distributed generation. There's a question uh, asking if you can differentiate between the two. Uh, is the former subset of the latter, uh, but for unrelated third party deals, the distributed term is critical. So can you give us just a quick definition, small scale embedded generation versus distributed generation? I think when we started out in, in uh, I'm gonna to refer to 2012, when we presented at Solar South Africa in 2012, we still referred to rooftop. At that time, the IPP was the big, the big one and so on. So all of that has transgressed down to, to the, embedded generation side, which essentially said you generate um, embedded into the building, into the load side of, of, of the meter. So distributed just means that they currently have a vertical uh, integrated grid, like I showed you the ESCOM grid flowing down to the consumers. You're now going to have a, uh, a distributed grid from various technologies and electricity flowing in various directions. Uh, so distributed grid would moreover be embedded generation would be part of that. So distributed generation could even entail a wind farm uh, sitting on, on, on the west coast together with a solar farm sitting in the Northern Cape, which are all distributed, whereas, as, as, and, and it could be owned privately and publicly by government or privately. So distributed is a very much uh, larger term for, 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 for the whole call it energy mix that, that will ensue. I've, I've got a slide that I, I can't now present uh, that shows that very nicely how you would have this integrated grid with different technologies. But embedded generation is now being referred to as something that sits behind a meter. And the purpose of that is then to first supply the electricity within that premises and excess gets exported. So the purpose of that one is not to be a primary generator only. That's perhaps in short the Summary, but I, I would have loved to share visuals on that, but that will do in a later stage. Excellent. Thank you for that, Devilis. We are out of time, colleagues. Thank you for the time. Uh, that concludes very insightful presentations for today and, and uh, a bit of a QA session, uh, allowing us to better understand the distributed generation policy and regulatory framework. Uh, we covered the policy uh, supporting distributed generation, the implementation of the policy. Uh, exploring some of the challenges and opportunities to streamline the processes for more meaningful participation. Uh, we also covered the technical requirements and the need for national standards and the proactive approach from SELGA in supporting municipalities to undertake uh, small-scale embedded generation as part of distributed generation. Uh, I think with that, uh, a big thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your time. Uh, thank you to our organizers, Safia, the team, uh, especially Kim, uh, Nokwanda at Zerni for all of the marketing support, our partners, the Minerals Council and the Energy Intensive Users Group. Uh, and a very big thank you to our sponsors, Rand Merchant Bank and Genesis Eco Energy, who've made it possible for us to have this series of webinars to share the information as we are. Uh, and not forgetting you, the audience, for tuning in uh, and listening to the insightful presentation. Uh, we are uh, going to answer the questions that have been posed in writing. You will receive them from uh, the speakers. 
Uh, and I think with that, uh, I wish you all a very good rest of the afternoon. Thank you for joining us.